Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Elias. I'm the president of global development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And also for this evening, more importantly, I'm currently the chair of the governing body for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And in both of those capacities, I really want to wish you uh, a thank you, a good evening, and welcome you here for what I think is going to be an amazing hour of discussion. Um, I want to, in particular, start by thanking the Moth. I think I was one of the earliest subscribers to the Moth podcast <laughs> when they only had about 15 episodes on. And uh, it's really grown uh, because it's helped us to understand some of the world's most complex problems through human stories. And we're going to experience that this evening. So I really want to thank the Moth. We've had an important partnership with them on many of our issues um, uh, for polio eradication, for women's health, the maternal health. Uh, we had an important event with the Moth in Seattle recently as we opened our new exhibit on, on safe motherhood um, at our, our visitor center, Discovery Center in Seattle. Um, and I had some prepared talking points that were largely about numbers, you know, that um, uh, we're going to, I was going to supposed to say that, you know, since Rotary led us in getting the World Health Organization to declare the goal of eradicating polio back in the 1980s, we've made progress. In, it said 99.9%. I think it's actually 99.999%. Um, we're this close. Um, and uh, and there have been 20 million cases of paralysis that have been prevented. The numbers are important, but uh, I think the stories are more important. Um, and I'll tell you one story. I, I've been here, as all of you have, for the UN General Assembly week, and I've been in a very busy week, and I was with Bill Gates yesterday, and we had a little break between meetings, and we discovered that we have a similar morning ritual. We both wake up every morning and look at the polio dashboard to see if there are new cases and where they were and what we're going to do about them. Um, and, you know, as the chair of the Polio Oversight Board, I've had the opportunity in the last few years to travel to most, if not all, of the, the polio-affected countries and to actually talk to both the, the, the survivors of polio um, as well as the tragic uh, stories of families who have lost um, children to polio. And it's those stories that actually get me out of bed every morning to look at those numbers and those dashboards and so I really want to, you know, thank the Moth for our partnership to come together tonight to hear some of those stories, to make the numbers real, because the reality is that we're very, very close. We are 99.999% of the way there. We've only had seven cases of wild poliovirus in the world, uh, and we're three-quarters of the way through the year. So we're almost done. But in order to be done, we need to hear many voices to, to sustain, as you've all heard in various UN sessions, there's a fatigue, there's tremendous demands for resources, there are many competing good causes. And to finish the job on polio, we're going to need to continue to raise up all of our voices, including from the, the, the very powerful stories you'll hear from our, our presenters this evening. So let me thank you all again for coming. And to introduce our host, uh, Rich Besser, who's an old friend and colleague after a, an, a, a long, distinguished career at the, U, uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He was then the chief health and medical editor for ABC News. And now he's the president for the last seven years of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, one of our country's leading foundations. We're really working to promote a culture of health based in equity. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next hour, and thank you all for coming. Rich? Well, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, thank you, Chris. It is uh, an absolute pleasure to be here with, with all of you. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Moth uh, Polio Main Stage event, and I, I agree with Chris that the next hour, I think, is going to be absolutely terrific. Another round of applause for, for Chris and for, for Anna, our, our musician. So we are all delighted you're here for this event. It's titled, Don't Stop Now, Stories from the Final Push to End Polio. And uh, tonight's event is a collaboration between the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and The Moth, which has allowed us to bring incredible storytellers from around the globe here uh, to be with us tonight. 
uh, to help increase our energy around ending po polio for, for all time. Uh, personal stories are of the utmost importance. Uh, as Chris was saying, when you're down to seven cases, uh, understanding uh, the lives who are touched and what can be done if we eradicate polio once and for all is, is so important. Uh, but before we get to the stories, uh, a few housekeeping details. Um, please turn off your cell phones. So that's not mute, that's not turned down. And the reason for that is this is being recorded and your cell phone can interfere with the recording. And we want to make sure that this ends up on a podcast and is heard around the globe. So if you can just turn it off, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, next is please no flash photography. So if you're up here telling a story and you get a flash, um, it kind of can take you out of your game. So um, first to the moth, um, how many of you, uh, by a round of applause, um, have heard of the moth before? Excellent. And, and how many of you are brand new to the moth? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I am a huge moth fan. I've been a moth listener like Chris for a really long time. And so to be up here and emceeing a moth event for me is like, um, this is big stuff. Uh, the moth has been around for 26 years. At this point, over 60,000 stories have been told at the moth. Um, that's amazing. On stages all around the world, um, we believe that the true personal stories, they bridge divides, they help you uh, see the humanity in, in each other, and they can really lead to, to significant and real change. So if you're new to The Moth, you can listen to the stories on The Moth podcast, which is, is, has been downloaded 100 million times each year. Which is, um, that's unbelievable. Um, so tonight you're going to hear three storytellers who are, who are all graduates of The Moth Global Community Program. So this is a workshop and performance series which The Moth runs around the globe to help advocates develop and use their personal stories for their work. Uh, an amazing approach to global health and global health communications. So um, a few notes on how a Moth uh, session works and how tonight will work. The stories are told without notes. Unlike me, I get notes. Uh, <laughs> but it's not stand-up. It's not a lecture. Um, these are true personal stories. And so no reading is allowed as, as part of that. Um, to ensure that each storyteller gets their time, uh, there is timekeeping that takes place. Each storyteller is allowed nine minutes to tell their stories. That's not a lot of time. Um, Anna Nordmo um, is here to help us on that. So Anna, uh, when, when they reach the nine minutes, um, you're going to play a little music. How does that sound? That's nice, right? That's nice. If the storyteller doesn't really hear that and keeps going for a couple minutes more, what's it going to sound like? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a little different sound. And that means it's, it, it really is time to, to wrap it up. Um, on a more serious note, the stories that you're hearing tonight are true. Uh, they're personal. Um, and because they're all centered around polio, um, we're exploring a serious, a serious subject. And I know that for some people uh, that may be a little challenging and maybe a little triggering. If you find that you need to step outside, um, please do. Uh, please take, uh, take care of yourself. Um, and with that, we're going to uh, go ahead and get started. The storyteller's bios are all in the materials, and so I'm, I'm not going to read through those. Um, but to bring up each person to the stage, um, I've asked each of them to, to answer one question. And that question is, uh, what would a world free of polio mean for you and for your family? And you know, I, I thought about that for myself. I'm a general pediatrician. And so over the course of my life, I vaccinated thousands and thousands of kids against, against polio. And what it would mean for me as a pediatrician is I would no longer have to vaccinate against polio. We don't vaccinate against smallpox. Smallpox is the only disease that we've intentionally, intentionally wiped off the face of the, uh, uh, of the earth, and, sm and polio could join that. But it takes incredible effort. And, and I'm reminded of, of uh, uh, an event that took place early in my time at ABC News. It was 12 years ago, and I was a pretty new reporter. And the Gates Foundation had given us at ABC News money to, couple, to cover global health. And so one of the first stories that, that I was able to do was on polio eradication. And uh, what we did was we went to India. India was in the midst of trying to get certified 
as polio free. And so we went to India to see what it takes to, to make that happen. And the effort is enormous. What India decided to do in terms of their approach was to have global immunization days. So several days during the year, two and a half million healthcare workers would fan out across the country and vaccinate 172 million children in a day. And they, their approach was if you could do that over a series of, of, of uh, times in a year, you could wipe polio out. And so we went there and we got to participate. We went uh, to New Delhi and we went to the busiest train station in New Delhi. And I arrived there and I met a local imam. And he was there to help improve the confidence in polio vaccination among Muslim families. And I met all these healthcare workers. And then the most incredible thing happened. We heard a train approaching the train station. So the healthcare workers lined up on the platform and I lined up with them and the imam was there as well. The train pulled in and stopped and the windows came down on the cars and up and down the train track, all of these mothers on the train, they held their babies out the window. And we put drops of polio vaccine into their mouths. They pulled their babies back, the windows went up, and the train pulled out. And all over India, that was what was taking place. Two years later, India was certified as polio free. So it's that kind of effort that we need to see and continue to, to get to, those, to, to that zero. So uh, with that, let me, uh, let me turn to our first uh, storyteller. Who's ready for our first storyteller? All right, so when I asked our first storyteller, what would a world free of polio mean for you and your family? He said, polio eradication means a safer, healthier, and wealthier planet for the next generation. Please welcome Wasif Mahmoud. In the spring of 2019, I visited a remote Pakistani village to monitor polio immunization campaign. After going to 30 houses, I found out that none of the child had been vaccinated. I did not give up and decided to go even further to the next house. Then I knocked at the door. After getting knocking at the door three times, I hear an angry male voice from behind the door, and he was asking me, if I had any business with him. I introduce myself and tell him that I'm here to monitor polio campaign and see if the children have been vaccinated. Then there is a, there is a, a moment of silence and after a few moments, he comes out of the door and glares into my eyes. I tell him that I am here to see the finger marks of the children because in Pakistan, they vaccinate uh, children and they mark the fingers of the children. Uh, they mark the little part of the finger and then also mark the nails of the children uh, in, in, in order to avoid an ambiguity if the child has been uh, vaccinated or not. He tells me that there is no child in the house. As I'm talking to him, I can see ch children playing in, in, uh, right behind his back. And I'm, I'm confused. And then he slams the door and just disappears inside. I have never seen such, a, such an aggressive attitude uh, during the polio campaigns. I'm despondent, I am, I am upset and confused. Then I ask this man, uh, then I, I talk, about, talk to myself about it, and then I decide, since I'm scared, I decide to go back to, I've, I have already spent few hours in the field and I decide to go back to my hotel. I go back to my hotel and switch on the TV and see there's only one news which is being flashed on the TV channels and it is about the polio immunization campaign. That the vaccinators are coming under attack by the community manga members due to a hoax about the vaccine that it is not safe. That the vaccine is making children fall sick. And due to this, they are attacking it. They're attacking the polio vaccinators. And I'm, I'm in a state of shock and a state of disbelief looking at this news. As I'm flat, uh, 
surfing on the TV channels and looking at the TV channels, I, my phone rings up and I see my wife calling up. I re respond to the call, her call and she talks to me very fastly and she asks me the first question, if I was, I, if I was I, I, all right, I tell her I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm all right. Then she asks the second question that why was I, I inaccessible for the last, for the last few hours? I tell her that because since I go to in, in remote areas and where there are no signals, I might be inaccessible, but she breaks down in tears. He is not ready to believe me. I try to calm her down and I tell her that it's the nature of my job. I have to go to such places where there are security concerns and where there is inaccessibility. And I can, and, and also remind her of the discussion that we have had a few years back when our son f fell ill. I said, do you remember we had a discussion that when our son fall, fell ill and we took him to doctors and we, they ran so many tests on him and we began to suspect that he had polio. He couldn't move. And we began to suspect that he had polio. And remember what we, what we discussed? And thanks to God he did not have polio. Doctors did pronounce that he does not have polio and he had some infection. And, uh, and he got all right and then he walked. And we decided that I'll continue this job this, till the polio is eradicated. And you agreed. And she said yes. At this moment, uh, she says, stay safe, and she hung up the phone. Um, in the evening, I received an email from the country office. The polio campaigns have been uh, suspended and due to citing security fears. And this really put me in a uh, position of shock because here I was uh, wanting to eradicate polio and uh, getting closer to eradication and this now this incident. But I begin to think, I started pondered over and over again to find a way out if the polio campaigns can be resumed. How, do, how we can do it? And I, my mind got stuck over this friend who was from the same community, but, uh, and he was also revered by many people. And, uh, and at this time, a, f a suggestion from one of my friends echoed in my mind that I need to have from the same community to have friendships with them and whenever I visit them to such rural communities, I need to take with them and be friends with, this, with these people from the same community, make friends, uh, partnerships with them. So I decided to uh, uh, get in touch with him, contact him, and I called him over the phone and explained him the whole situation that this is all because of a misunderstanding and uh, we cannot uh, leave it here. But he cites his own fears, excuses, that uh, that community will not uh, follow him the same way if he had joined the fight against polio. Uh, uh, so he excuses. But I do not take this no for a no and decide to give him a visit the next day. So I go there the next day. I see him sitting on the floor wearing this beautiful shawl and wearing this religious cap and reading from the Quran. I just go, go there and sit right beside him and start the conversation and ask him if he's ready to change his decision. He doesn't say anything. Then I ask him if he has kids. Then he looks at me and says, yes, he has three, five kids. I tell him I have three, and we need to work for our kids, not for just us, but for the rest of the community. And at this point, I hold on to his shawl and request him that we need to, con continue, we need to do this for our children. To this, he agrees. And he says that he will call a meeting of the elders the next day and see what he can, what, how they react. The next day, I remember going to the mosque and all of the community elders were already seated inside the mosque veranda on the floor and they were all waiting for me. And uh, I walked there very confused and with sweat uh, falling over my forehead and walked up there and tried to exclaim the situation and tried to address their questions. But they didn't look, sat look satisfied. S uh, at this point, this prayer leader, whom I talked, he just walked in. When they saw him, they all stood up in respect. And they signaled them to sit down. They all sat down. And it started by asking if all of them knew him. And they said, yes, we all knew him. Then he asked if he trusted him. He said, they all said, yes, they trusted him. Then it explained them, this is because, this is all the incident that has happened uh, during the last week is, is, was a hoax. And they need to understand that Islam emphasizes much uh, uh, lays much emphasis on preventive 
healthcare and there is um, and in, it's in ahadith that you cannot uh, leave your children uh, without giving them preventive health care if you leave them without preventive health care and they fall prey to the virus they on the day of judgment they will children will hold them accountable and at this time at this point he discloses that one of children had fallen ill to fallen to uh, to polio when he was a, 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 a he was young so do not go do not make right, wrong choices for your children at this point one of the man from the community gets up and ensures that he will vaccinate his children and after looking at him all the uh, people from the community start got up and start giving started giving insur- assurances that will vaccinate the children in the next campaign and th- throughout when he was speaking this prayer leader i was in a state of displease i was i was not hoping they will come out that open and and the community will also accept him but they did and my god he did a really great job <laughs> and stood out and uh, then uh, in a few weeks after this the campaign was resumed and i heard receiving a call from one of my friends who was from the community and he uh, said that everybody is uh, cooperating and the vaccination coverage in the three days is more than 95 percent i was over the moon i was so happy to hear about this but i didn't stop there i decided to go to the same village again which uh, gave me a cold shoulder when i went there last time this time they opened their uh, opened their arms and they welcomed with welcomed me and uh, they gave me red carpet welcome they all opened their doors they all showed their uh, brought their uh, children to me and all showed their fingers and all of their fingers were marked blue their nail and little part of the finger were marked blue with the marker and uh, which showed that they have been vaccinated they took me to their guest house and they offered me kava and sat there and sipped kava with them and they all brought the children there as well and i saw i was surprised and was so happy to see that all of the children have had been vaccinated and at that point i realized that we could not do it alone we need partners we need friends we need community members to work with us and help us eradicate polio for good thank you Wasif Mahmoud, uh, everyone, round of applause. You know, his, his, his story really shows the extent that people in the field have to go to, to, to bridge divides, to problem solve, if we're going to make it over the line. And uh, bridging those kind of divides is absolutely essential, and it can be done uh, when, when you listen and you learn. Okay. Uh, when I asked our next storyteller, what would a world free of polio mean for you and your family? She answered, to me, a polio-free world would mean children can grow up healthy and strong without limitations. Please welcome Safia Ibrahim. I remember when I was six years old, I would wake up every morning and crawl out of bed and go to the bathroom to comb my hair and brush my teeth. I would then crawl to the front steps of my grandmother's house and watch my peers as they walked to school with a thermos in hand and a backpack on their backs. I wanted to go to school too, but I contracted polio at the age of one, and I was left out of school. One day, I saw two girls playing a childhood game of hopscotch. 
I wanted to play. So I crawled up to them and said, may I please join you? One of them looked at me with a laugh and said, how are you going to hop when you cannot even stand? Not even knowing what I was doing, I immediately grabbed that girl by the leg and dragged her down to my level. <laughs> Next thing I knew, I was, um, I was pulling punches while another girl was pulling my hair. <laughs> Luckily, my aunt was visiting and she saw what was happening and plucked me out of the dust and threw me over her shoulder. She took me back to my grandmother's house. And my, brother, my grandmother, when she opened the door, she said, what does she do now? Because back then, I was known as a rebel. <laughs> that was the day my grandmother decided that I was going to have to learn to walk if I was going to continue fighting with other children. Using the wall and furniture and with my grandmother's reassurance and confidence in me, I myself gained confidence in my new ability. But walking also came with falling, with new challenges, and that included falling. Every time I stood up, I fell down, but then I got back up again. Then I stood up, then I fell back down again. Eventually, I my legs were strong enough for me to walk to the corner store to fetch oil and rice for my grandmother, just like the other children in my neighborhood did for their parents. Two years later, the Civil War in Somalia broke out, and my family and I immigrated to Canada. For the first time, I was able to see a doctor about my diagnosis, and he gave me two braces that reached up to my thighs and crutches for support. Most importantly, this is the time when I started going to school as well. This is the time I first felt ordinary because that's all I wanted to be growing up. I graduated from elementary school, graduated from high school, and I even went to college. I was starting to feel ordinary once more. At that point, I've decided the next thing to do would be to get married. I fell in love and got married, and I got pregnant. I went to go see my doctor, and she told me to be careful because I was high risk. A couple months later, as I was coming home from work, driving my car, I went down to the garage. I parked my car, and I walked to the elevator. As I was walking, the crutches I was given for support slid, and I fell front forward onto the cold cement floor. I was 27 weeks and five days pregnant. I felt sharp, strong pain travel down my stomach to my pelvis and to my back. But what was more concerning to me was I didn't know how I was going to get back up. Using my crutches once more, I was able to stand up, went into the elevator, got to my apartment, took a shower, and went to bed. The next morning, I woke up with cramps, very strong, dull cramps. I immediately called my doctor, and she told me to go to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room, but then I was sent to the labor and delivery ward. They did an x-ray, and I sat in a room waiting for the doctor to come. I waited and waited and waited. Eventually, he showed up with his head down, looking at the ground. He said, Safia, unfortunately, we were not able to detect a viable heartbeat. You will need to be induced today. 
I was in disbelief. I mean, just last week, my friends threw me a baby shower. And they gave me bottles, baby blankets, and a nursing pillow. I was looking forward to raising my son, playing with my son, even vaccinating my son so he could have an ordinary life, just, that I, just as I imagined it to be. I, the next day, I went home. I cried. I was angry. How could polio come back and take something that was, that was precious to me? Just like that. Because my whole life, I have been fighting polio. And I have been beating polio. But this time, it felt like polio got me. But then... I realized I'm not the type of person that um, focuses on what ifs. I'm the type of person that focuses on what could be. I decided that I could get pregnant again and I will have another child. Within months, I was pregnant, this time with a baby girl. I took every precaution possible I went on early maternity leave. I stayed home in the winter months and waited for my daughter to come into the world. In the summer of 20, 2008, my daughter introduced herself to the world with the loudest cry I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> Couple years after that, I, two years after that, I had another daughter, then a son. Now, I'm a mother of three. Just recently, I was at the store with my son at the cash register, and um, I fell, actually. I fell down, and I said really loudly, wait, it's OK. I'm fine. I always fall, but then I get back up. And my son looked back, and I said, hey, don't you think I'm getting the hang of this? I'm OK. I don't think I fall as much as I used to anymore. My son looked at me with a mischievous smile. And he said, mom, you just fell in January, February, March, <laughs> April. <laughs> but then I realized um, polio doesn't really affect our family because we're just used to me falling. And I was like, OK, so this is our ordinary. And then I realized, because at that point that I defeated polio, and I wasn't just ordinary like I hoped to be, but I was extraordinary. Thank you. Safia Ibrahim, please, everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for an extraordinary story. Um, that also connects us to why it's so important to go after every case of, of, of polio. Uh, we have a, a very special guest uh, in the audience. Uh, Safia's youngest daughter is here with us today. Um, um, please, uh, round of applause for her. For her, she's down front here. I, I saw her filming, very proud of her, her mom. Um, and we have another very special guest here with us uh, uh, tonight to tell us a bit about his work to, to end polio. Please welcome to the stage uh, the artist, producer, member of Exile, a Japanese uh, boy band group, and an advocate to end polio, Tetsuya. Please. Hi. 
Japanese say, Konbanwa. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tetsuya. And it is an honor to be here tonight. Today, I would like to introduce a project we are learning in Japan to raise awareness for the fight to end polio. Let me start with an introduction. I am an artist and producer in LDH, one of Japan's largest entertainment companies. LDH stands for Love, Dream, Happiness. Inside LDH, I am a member of Exile, a Japanese boy band for 22 years. Exile has won many awards and continues for Philip Studios today. LDH and the Exile operate many social initiatives for children around Japan under the mission Dreams for Children. As an artist, I love to communicate the joy of dancing with children. But I was shocked when I learned that there are still children in the world who are stuff suffering from polio, even though it is a preventable disease. This is why I decided to become the ambassador for the Recycle to End Polio project. In Japan, the government and many organizations have been working on polio eradication for many years. And I wanted to use my experience and influence in the entertainment industry to support the cause. We came up with the idea to collect and recycle plastic bottle caps. In partnership with JCV, we donate polio vaccines with the proceeds of the plastic bottle caps. We held a launch event with Japanese politicians who support the fight for polio and set up recycling boxes at the politicians' offices and other locations, such as coffee shop uh, that I, I produce called Amazing Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and dance crews, concert venues, and more. We also launched a social media campaign where one polio vaccine was donated for every post of a photo of caps with, with a heart draw on them. The campaign is still ongoing, but we have been covered by many media outlets, over 4,000 social media posts, and collected over 40,000 caps. The synergy was amazing and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has kindly asked us uh, that they would like to expand this campaign from Japan to other countries as a successful example. To end my speech, we must come together and continue the fight to end polio. When we come together, we can create a world where no child has to suffer from this preventable disease. I will continue to do my best to bring smiles to children around the world through the power of entertainment. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tetsuya. Um, we have one more storyteller to bring to the stage, but before I bring them up, uh, a few announcements. Um, tonight's show was directed by Sarah Austin Jeunes and produced by Ignacia Delgado. Uh, quite a few people to thank, so maybe hold the applause to the end so you can hear all the names. Our musician, uh, Anna Nordmo, a big thank you to Jasmine Shields and the Stavros Ni uh, Niarchos Foundation Library. Thank you to the amazing production te team, catering staff, security agents, and volunteers, uh, the Bill and Melinda, uh, Melinda Gates Foundation for making this event possible, especially Amber Zetti's, Chris Elias, 
Fatima Riaz and our other support team, Kathy Williams, Adriana Grinder, and the entire GHS team, the amazing Tetsu uh, Tetsuya, and all of today's storytellers. Round of applause for them all. Okay, our, our final storyteller. Um, when I asked this storyteller, what would a world free of polio mean for you and your family? He answered, a polio-free world in which no one's potential is paralyzed or truncated by polio. And that includes my family. Please welcome Oyewale Tormoro. When you get to be as old as I am, <laughs> the world will have thrown many curveballs into you. Some you hit, some you dodge. But in your carelessness, some will hit you on your face. <laughs> I started life as a young virologist in Nigeria. Then it was a new area, and we were looking for fame. We wanted to be famous. We discovered new viruses. Sometimes we even toyed with the idea of getting some of those branches named after us. <laughs> Tomori virus, <laughs> Oyewali virus. But I think it was an error because if it had been today with COVID around and I come in and said, Mr. COVID is coming in, <laughs> you will all run away, you know. <laughs> but that was it on. But then for us as virologists and the perfection is that we were, the specimen was more important than the, than, than the person from who you got the specimen from. The virus was more important than the victim. We're out there looking for the best specimen. And you get it when the person was very sick. And that was what we were looking for. We're not interested in whether you are sick or whether you to be very sick so that we can get our virus from you. And so there was an outbreak in Nigeria around 1973. And we were rushing out there to go and get in this new virus, hopefully, whatever it is. And what happened? The car in which I was going decided to break down. Hmm. Not being a, being a virus specialist and not a vehicle specialist, I had to call the mechanic to come and look at it. What was the mechanical virus that paralyzed my car? <laughs> so while I was waiting for him, I decided to take a look around where I was. And where we parked was actually a house where it says, welcome the Hope House for the Physically Handicapped. I said, well, since I wasn't doing anything, let me just walk in. And so I walked into the house. And in the room, from different corners, came in people with different degrees of disability. Some were totally paralyzed in all the four arms and legs. Some were walking with sticks. Some had to be carried. And it was so heart-rendering to see such severity of disability, all congregated together in one place. I ran away. I almost forgot my car. Or days after, weeks after, the picture kept coming back to me. Why should there be so much pain in the world? It wasn't that I had not seen people who had uh, uh, paralysis before. Even in my family, we had the another brother who was you know, carrying a stick and walking with a stick. And young boys that we are, occasionally we hid his stick so that he couldn't walk. <laughs> I remember in my primary school also, there was a guy who actually had the same name as myself, but he also had, was paralyzed with one leg. Both of us were troublesome, but it was easy to distinguish who was the one. We say Tom was really one with, we were really one with the leg and the one that walked normally. But those are the things we assumed was normal. But when you see that concentration that I saw that day, I think it was really. But then it was not, they were not looking for my sympathy. They were not looking for my sorrow. We needed to do something about it. Otherwise, there were not enough homes to, to make them. Because at that time, my country was having like about three, four cases of polio per day. And if we had multiplied that, we would have a bit of a problem. Not only that, these people would be suffering and there would nothing we could do about it. So I then took a decision that. Both professionally and personally, I must get involved in the activities of these people. And so I, got, I became a member of the committee, the, uh, the, the welfare committee that was looking at the welfare of these people. 
And I rose through that, not only becoming the chairman of the Welfare Committee, but the chairman of the entire board. We gave me the opportunity to work with the government so that I can build a school for the handicapped next door to them, so that you can give scholarship to them, so you can go to places. On the professional side, I mean, I thought about it that what could we do? The earlier and the faster we did the diagnosis, the easier it was for people to take a response. And so our lab, I then got working with the WHO, in which I participated with support from Rotary Intention and others, to set up a network of laboratories within the African region in which we're able to, every country had access to a laboratory and we they can make quick diagnosis and prevent the spread of the disease. Back home in Nigeria, I joined the, the committee that was involved with the uh, with polio eradication. And we again in, interviewed with the government, it got into the policy decisions so that polio could be related. Uh, we thought it was a short journey, 10 years, 20 years. Still, there are problems everywhere. You know, when I started uh, polio, there was no strand of gray hair on my head. <laughs> but the crown of glory came that day when Africa was declared free of, of polio. And we had this big meeting, 54 countries in all of our, each of us in our different places. It was a year of COVID, so we couldn't meet. And we sat down listening to the report how Africa has made progress from so many cases, three cases per day to no case for three, four years. And the chairperson come up and announced that this is my pleasure and delight to announce to you all that Africa is finally declared free of the wild polio. I cried that day. Just. It was a cry of joy, not the cry of the pain I saw that first time. And so we thought the end had come only for us to hear that this smart virus had mutated again and was now attacking those who were, not, who were poorly immunized or not immunized at all. And so, yes, we conquered wild polio, but the tame virus was still there. And until every case of polio in penetration in the world, what we did with the wild, we must do together for the tame one, so that at no time in the world will any child ever get polio. You remember, smallpox was there. Now it's related to the history book. Let us pick, take polio and put it back into the history book and not allow it to deform beautiful children that will continue to come. Thank you. Uh, oh, you're Wale uh, 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 Tomori. Thank you so much. May we one day hear the cry of joy throughout the entire world. Well, we have uh, had quite an evening. Uh, some incredible stories here tonight. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, there are so many people in the room here who've committed their lives to ending polio. And I want to thank all of you who are here. But every single person in the room uh, has a role to play. Um, tonight, take a photo of yourself and share it with the hashtag endpolio. Help raise awareness throughout the world to the importance of finally getting this over the line. Um, you can also make a donation to, to endpolio.org, and your contribution will be matched two to one by the Gates Foundation. I'm confident that working together, we will see a day uh, where the world is truly free of, of polio. We hope that you will continue to share your stories, uh, creating communities of change, um, keep the conversation going and share your thoughts on these stories. Feel free to post on social media. Uh, again, use that hashtag and polio so that people involved in that conversation will, will hear your thoughts. Uh, and you can also uh, post on, on The Moth. And you can find The Moth on Twitter and Facebook at, um, at The Moth and on Instagram at Moth Stories. And to hear more stories from The Moth and to learn more about getting involved, you can go to themoth.org. The moth so I want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, we hope to see you again soon, uh, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.